I greet each and every one of you on this fourth day that we've been celebrating weekday liturgies this week. So it's been a journey. Uh, we began with the dormition or the death of, the, of Anne, who's the mother of the Theotokos. We went on to Pariscavi, the great martyr from Rome from the second century. We dealt with St. Pantalemon, the great martyr and the unmercenary physician, who of course comes to us at the very beginning of the fourth century. And then today we move on to, first of all, we have what? We have Apostles of the Seventy, Nicanor, Prochorus, Timon, and Parmenas. So sometimes I think we have to sort of broaden our horizons a bit. When we talk about the Apostles, we usually focus on the Twelve, Matthias having replaced Judas. But we know if we look at the Gospels, there's also a broader group. So maybe numbers are important. We have an inner circle, James, Peter, and John. We have the 12 apostles that we're more familiar with. And then there was a larger group that Christ called and worked with, the 70. And they were sent out in his lifetime to preach, to heal. And we indeed have their memory today. So when we look at them, we know we have Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas. Several of them ended up bishops. Two of them did. Uh, Two of them were martyred, two of them died a natural death. The epistle we had today touched upon them, but it also uh, discusses the idea of with the growth of the church, ministry needs to be expanded. And we have the gospel that refers to the institution of the office of deacon. So we have the first seven deacons. Of course, when we talk about ministry, we know that each and every person who is baptized and receives the Great Commission has ministry. So all of us have ministry. Maybe the job of clergy is to kind of coordinate the ministries of the body of Christ to all people. So that's our job. We know that one of the major commemorations of St. Irini, or Irene, the abbess of the monastery of Crucibalanthu, uh, she comes to us from the ninth century. We know that she's from that area of Cappadocia, which is in Asia Minor, that kind of mountainous region uh, in modern-day Turkey, but the heartland of the Greek experience. She comes to us really in the middle of the ninth century. She is indeed one of the people that were to come to Constantinople, the order of the Empress Theodora, who was looking for a bride for her son, the Emperor Michael. So Theodora and Michael are very important because they are the ones that finally end the iconoclast controversy. All right, and Irene, along with her sister, was called to Constantinople. The sister made it, and she indeed married the brother of the Empress Theodora, uh, but the path of Irene was changed. She encountered St. Ioniki the Great, who said that her calling was in instead to be a monastic. She would be associated with the monastery of Crisivalanthu, and indeed she would be its abbess. So we know that she's there. She spends many, many years. She lives to be 103 years old. So by the, when she's passing through this area, she's lucky if she's 20. So we know that she goes to the monastery of Christophe Her prayer life, her ascetical life is so deep that she indeed is transformed. We hear that she spends multiple uh, nights standing with her arms uh, looking heavenward and praying that God may indeed forgive her and have mercy upon her. And through this, she is transformed. She is granted the gift of clairvoyance. She can see and understand what's going on in people's minds, what their behavior is, and she uses this to help them. She indeed eventually is chosen to be the abbess of the monastery. Not that she wants to be abbess, but she is selected as abbess. And she is a good guide who's very strict and ascetical with herself, very loving for the nuns under her direction. We hear that she even sort of appears in a dream to the emperor when he wrongly convicts a man, and it's by her intercessions that he's released. We have an incident that uh, one of the things that's recorded, and in connection with Irini Kusivalantu, there's the blessing of apples. So we'll see that later this week. But we know that in her case, a sailor visits her from Patmos, and the sailor has three apples with him, which he said were given to him by St. John the Evangelist, St. John the Theologian, the writer of the uh, fourth gospel. And those apples, the first one, she eats and is satisfied for a whole month. 
The second one she gives indeed to her, uh, her nuns on Great and Holy Thursday, and the other one she keeps as a reminder of what happens. Uh, there's also sort of a notion that women who have difficulty conceiving children pray to uh, Saint Irini, and uh, when they eat the apple with their prayers, it's supposed to be a protector and a help in the idea of conception. Very, very important lives to a ripe old age. Before she dies, she designates her successor, who she says is chosen by God, and then she reposes in peace at 103 years old. So we remember her steadfastness. We look at her ascetical life, her life of purifying herself that she may unite herself to Christ, and we're reminded of that. When we commemorate the Apostle of the Seventy, we remember their work. We also realize we have an apostolic call too, and the word apostle comes from the Greek verb apostolin, which means to be sent out. So the apostles, the church, and we are sent out in the world to bring it back to Christ. So I would ask you to come forward and receive the Antideron.